It is March the 13th, 2021, and this is The Future of Photography. The Future of Photography. Hello, hi, welcome back to The Future of Photography. It's Chris, it's Adrian, it's Imar, and Jeremiah. Hello. 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 How are Hello. you? Hi. Yeah. COVID okay. fine. Oh, it's fine. We just noticed, uh, just noticed uh, in front of no. Well, we were we were pointed towards the fact that when this episode releases, Imar has to put a hat on. I'm gonna put my hat on right now. Huh? What? Where? There we go. Oh. It's gonna be Saint top of the morning. Patrick's day. Top of the morning to you. <laughs> top of the morning to you. That is. Yeah, we all say that here all the yeah. time. The yeah, it, I know. <laughs> the Irish do this all the time. I've uh, been there. I've I should take it off now. I'm yeah. loving the green. So, well, it's, it's not it coming through because... It's a green face, yeah. It's, it's an interesting white, effect. But, but, but oh, the my, video my doesn't really show white. the green because we have a green screen thing going on, so it's cute. Uh, out. doesn't matter. Oh, no. It's a white hat oh, well. on the video. Doesn't matter. Speaking of video, speaking of video, it's very, true. very important. Uh, we already mentioned this recently, but this is on... Well, it's on the podcast, but this episode is also on our brand spanking new YouTube channel because... I'll just have to explain again very briefly. I had these videos for like when we started doing this on my private channel, but now it's on its own channel and uh, you can see it here and it is linked in the description. So um, now if you subscribe to the channel, which you all of course should do, then you will only be notified for new videos of the future photography and none of my other stuff. So that's a very I'm straightforward subscribed. thing. Oops, Does that count? stop the music. Hmm? Well, I think I think we all subscribe, so the numbers look a bit higher. But it's really kind of sad what it's looking like at this point. So we need to <laughs> well, kickstart this. Nobody knows we're alive. These things we're, take time. That's it. Nobody knows we're alive mm. and spread the word. Yeah. So so yeah. yeah click subscribe on the channel. Uh, the little bell, the thumbs up, whatever you can do to help. Absolutely. Us. And in ten years, we'll become an overnight sensation. Hours oh, slow burn. Which is how long it will typically take. So, um, <laughs> but we are we are patient. That is fine. And by the way, while you're at it, if you are watching this on YouTube and um, you are wondering how to get hold of this as well, there's also our website, and uh, this is what it looks like, and it has players on it, and you can click play on here, or you can subscribe to the podcast from there, and that's at thefutureofphotography.com. So we have uh, lots of different places. Can. For everybody that likes to listen to the back catalogue, which oh, is yeah. quite long now. There's three years of plus of back catalogue now. So. And all of those episodes are almost, almost all of them are fresh uh, as on the day when they came out. Almost. Freshly <laughs> baked. Freshly baked. No, it's, it's actually funny um, with, with podcasts. If you go back and that's one of the nature of podcasts that most of the episodes keep being online and uh, you can go back and cringe a bit when you made some weird oh, speculations cringe. that never came to fruition yeah. so mm. i don't cringe at that i think it's fun I think point, it's, point us to I, whatever we said would which did not happen um mm -hmm. and this episode is a workflow updates episode so we're gonna talk about how we make images right mm -hmm. pretty yep. much and i must say um, and I'm pointing at you, Jeremiah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, the, the, so, so what we do here uh, while preparing episodes is we have this shared photography album, this shared photo album that we put things in that we want to show on the episode. Um, this is what it looks like. Here we go. And in, in preparation of that, sometimes, well, we all put things in there. Or in this episode, Jeremiah was the only one who put things in there about <laughs> his photo workflows. And he put nine photos in there. Nine, and nine workflows. <laughs> did nine different workflows. And that left me quite with a, with a pretty, uh, pretty big feeling of uh, not being adequate. Because... <laughs> you know yeah, we call it too. inadequacy very much <laughs> inadequacy yeah the, the feelings the, 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 and, and i'm not sure because i mean i do have workflows but i've never really formalized them oh no you've got to think mm. of it this way chris or, it's not that more is better it's that somebody somebody that's got nine workflows clearly doesn't know what they're doing do they or that <laughs> <laughs> you just kind of <laughs> grasp at straws and hope for the best and then 
look back at what you have done, call that a workflow. Maybe maybe that's <laughs> yeah, what you're doing here, Jeremiah. Well, let's 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 start into that. So that's that was kind of the task. Let's just figure out how we do how we uh, how we approach our yeah. photos and not just the taking of the photos, but well, the how workflow, we the entire the process, photos, pretty yeah. much. Yeah. So. Yeah. Should we go by person? Should we? How should well, we I think we should let Jeremiah go first because he's got lots of stuff to share. I imagine we're all quite different as well. Time for you guys. Okay, Jeremiah. <laughs> um, so, so let me let me just bring up this window again, and should we go in through them by the order? Do you want to say yeah, something about one, all of them? One. Well, no, we we can. Uh, let me just. Uh, yeah, here's something that uh, this is uh, straight up street photography. Um, you know, captured, uh, I think with my like, I forget, uh, but it's a straight up capture and it was brought into my Lightroom. I keep, uh, I keep Lightroom as my management tool, mm -hmm. uh, for my library. Uh, I've been using it a long time. I probably have a hundred thousand pictures in it. Uh, I can find maybe 50,000 of those. <laughs> not too bad. Uh, it's no no it's organized reasonably well and i get better and better at it uh it's a single catalog which i've um i've played with multiple catalogs but the single catalog is is best it's backed up of course multiple places so when i bring something into uh, lightroom i use lightroom fundamentally as a darkroom processing in in other words it's as if i take a negative pour in some D76, chuck it around, fix it, wash it, hang it. Half of our and audience so, will not know what you're, what you're talking about just now. <laughs> but Adrian does. Uh, no, he doesn't. Anyway. <laughs> oh, I do. I do. It's, not, it's not something I do myself, but I do I know. know what it is. The, the point is that, that I don't use it for anything other than bringing out uh, everything that I feel is in the uh, digital uh, capture. Mm -hmm. Um, I will uh, sometimes go to the adjustment layer, but I, I prefer to do that in Photoshop uh, non-destructively, and I'll explain what that is. Once I'm happy with, with that, I will, ex I will edit it in Photoshop. Uh, and so they are linked and connected, and, and I will edit it in multiple ways. Because it's a street image, I really don't want to abstract it very much. Uh, I will use layers so that I can go back and adjust it. Mm. Um, so I, I'm not working on the pixel level. On a photograph like this, I probably did uh, just darken the sky ever so slightly. So I will have a layer for that. I kind of uh, definitely have a layer for the foreground uh, kid and, and darkened him and then kind of worked with the midtones uh, yet as another layer I will use curves uh, and then I will mask the curves to paint out uh, what I don't want um, and uh, hide what I do want just in pure tonality and I will then output it to a uh, Photoshop file um, and then print and we can talk about printing a little bit later but that that would be um, a, my simplest workflow. So of, of is that simple capture? Is that something? I mean, you you just fired this off as if you had explained that a uh, hundred times before. Is that something that you just do that way, or have you have you written it down? Have you documented it somewhere, or is it just something that since I've been, happened naturally because I've you've been, done it for so long? Yeah, since I've been doing it for so long, it comes second nature to mm. me. I've been using right. Photoshop since it came out. Um, not. Not to say that I'm an expert. I've never really met an expert in it, but I did met, meet the person who actually wrote the code for Photoshop. Oh, sure. Uh, he's probably, oh, no. he's prob <laughs> he is probably the expert. <laughs> I, I say probably because there is so much to that particular um, software mm. that uh, one could tailor it for one's needs. But, yes. but no, I've been using it a long time, and I, I just find that working in, in layers and masks uh, and I use a, a Wacom tablet, so I'm, I'm adjusting it. I feel I have a lot of control. Most of what I do, um, I have a lot of brushes too, which I can get into in other workflows. Um, but I, I use the pen pressure 
quite a lot in terms of, of burning and dodging and working on my layers. Mm. Uh, with street photography, I tend to work as little as possible. I try to make the capture as robust and simple as possible. Do you and just try to get there. do you crop after the fact? No, I, no. I almost never crop. Yeah. Never. Uh, maybe on five percent. And, and usually it's just to crop uh, uh, if I have to balance the horizon or flatten the horizon. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll just crop the edges. But I, I'm, I don't know why that is, but I've always uh, just felt very like a purist um, of capturing what's in the lens and, and making the decision uh, with framing while I'm there. Um, and and uh, it's worked out. That's interesting that you say that actually, because you shoot, mm. I think these days, street with a is is it a Leica Q two, which it has a a fixed lens, albeit it has some digital zooming options. Mm. But uh, you know, do do you ever get frustrated that you know, you can't quite capture the shot as as you imagine it, and therefore you do crop in post if you can't physically get to the right vantage point, for example, or something like that. Well, yeah, I, I use the Q2, and I also use the uh, monochrome. Um, and uh, the monochrome, you know, it's a, you know, I only go out with one lens if I'm traveling about. So I, I discipline myself on that way. The Q2 is interesting in that it does have a fixed lens, but it has, it's like a zoom, but it's not. You push a button, and it, it basically jumps in and re reformats it. And of course, you know, uh, makes the um, uh, the you know it, it, it's a smaller file, but you know because of the processing, the lens, the capture, it, it's pretty dazzling in terms of quality, even at the uh, smallest. Uh, so I will use that, uh, and I, I kind of treat it as just changing a lens rather than zooming uh, yeah. back and forth. Yeah. So I don't I don't really do that. Uh, um, I just find the discipline of having the four walls of frame uh, helps me to see um, when I'm kind of just out walking. Now, you know, I say all of that, and I, but I don't really consider myself a street photographer. Um, I, I, I tend to capture landscapes or shots without people. Um, and uh, especially during COVID, mm -hmm. <laughs> definitely don't do a lot of inner city the, grabbing. I, I, ghost towns. The, the, I, the, I, the crop thing is interesting um, uh, if, you, if you compare that between digital shooters and film shooters, because there's this, um, this matter of pride for film shooters to, to frame the shot exactly sure. the way they want it and then include the dark yes. frame around the photo in the scan to kind of prove that they didn't crop it so as a, as a digital that. shooter oh, as a digital shooter you don't have the luxury of doing that because you don't really have a frame around the photo you could put one in later it doesn't, doesn't prove anything <laughs> Digitally. but, but the no. analog one doesn't prove anything either because you will put this in lightroom anyway uh, I but think um, your crop thing is interesting too in that I just wonder, because I know it happens to me sometimes, do you ever go back and look at the image afterwards and just to detail that that you want to expand uh, upon or? Well, it, it, yeah, the, the, you know, the short answer is yes, uh, I do. Uh, I have, you know, when I began, I was very much what Chris, Chris would say, no, I want the edges of the frame. Mm. I, that's how I began my photographic mm. experience and it's just innate with me of how mm. I discipline myself there's no moral <laughs> rectitude mm. in, in doing it that way it, <laughs> it's just how I use photography but uh, and and I did do a lot of street shooting uh, in in those early years um, when I go back and plunder my library which is not often yet I always think oh I'll just leave it you know, I, I'm so I have so much new work anyway to process mm. um, that going back is not something that I've been doing. But should I do it, I would tend to take the more realistic images that I've shot and really abstract them. In, in other words, go to a street image that I shot, say, with, uh, you know, a 3200 ISO film, whether mm -hmm. it's, you know, uh, and, and really 
take a detail of that, blow it up, and really use the grain as a different kind mm, of, mm, of mm, mm. so recapturing an image using mm. old negatives is something that that I okay. I enjoy doing and I have done. Mm. That okay, that was that was your first workflow out of nine, and we are ten minutes, fifteen <laughs> minutes into the episode. <laughs> we didn't even talk about printing because printing is an enormous workflow. For I think me. that That's needs to be I mean. its own episode at one point. It probably does. Yeah. <laughs> I think Though it does. I did include it in the in the. So let thing. let's see which. Go, let's go around. Which other one? Oh no, okay. Let, let's go around. Okay, so um, go around the horn. If yeah, none of us has submitted any photos regarding <laughs> the workflow other yeah. than Jeremiah. So, um, Imar, how about your workflow? I can tell you right now that my workflow is pretty simple. <laughs> it's all about um, speed. Finding the time to even take a photo uh, lately has become really difficult for me. So I find myself um, even trying to do my three six five that. Occasional days I don't get outside much or get a picture, so I'm dipping back into kind of other things and playing around with stuff that I have already. But yeah, uh, working from home as well, it, I don't get out and about as much as I used to. So I find that even just capturing pictures has become just a little bit more difficult. You're not um, alone in that, definitely not. Yeah, um, my phone is my primary method of capture everybody knows that um halide has become my kind of go-to camera mm -hmm. which um is new to me in that um before i uh probably started on here with you i would have just used the in camera you know in phone camera um but i love that i love um uh, all the control that you have with it, and I love do the you, raw. Do you swipe to adjust the exposure and these kind of things? Yes, yes, yes. That's that's one of my major. Ma that's one yeah. of my my favorite features in Halite that you can yeah. just tap and swipe and change the exposure yeah. that way. And the shutter speed and stuff like that is great fun to play around with that stuff. So um, I'm kind of that's what I'm at at the moment. Um, afterwards, then initial changes always goes into snapseed first for me and uh i do what i want to is do with it in there is still available as a new app i I've, I've, wasn't that discontinued I don't know. and we we just have like a residue of it on our phones and if we delete oh, really? it we can never do i thought <gasps> there was something really? along those oh, lines no. I thought you, I thought let, let me did. let me figure it out go, go on mm, i'll, I'll look it up when here. I, when I, I, I use it i still it. use it all the time I, yeah i use no. it all the time and then um hipstamatic I, I like because I, as you said Jeremiah about trying to keep things in the frame and not cropping anything I like to use that to um, work in that way to kind of keep me within the frame and to make me frame it when I take the picture and I, you know I like to do that sometimes but since you've been able to import the new picture the pictures into the new hipstamatic I'm gone really cheaty with it because um, uh, it's just really it's really fun to play with uh, and to pull old images into it and play with them is really, I'm having a lot of fun in there. Um, a lot of what I, I, I would, um, oh my God, there's so many pictures and I don't even post most of what I do. Um, this week I had the, uh, the <laughs> opportunity to talk to an experimental poet on my own other podcast. And my mind is completely blown because I found out about a thing called asemic poetry which is visual poetry. Never heard of it. And it's avant-garde it, and quite punk, apparently. So um, I'd never heard of it either. Oh, my God, look it up. It is, it's mind-blowing. I'm, I'm just, my mind um, is blown and you, I'm really inspired by it. Can you put a link to that can episode of your other podcast in I can do, yeah, yeah. Because I think uh, that's interesting. For sure. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, by the way, warning, um, no, no false alert. Snapseed is still in the App Store, but it looks abandoned because the last oh. update for it was bug fixes for iOS 13.1 one year ago. Ooh, wow. So okay. I'm not yeah. sure it is still kind of supported or anything. So use it, oh. um, but don't rely on it for um, to be around for like another yeah. couple of years. Uh, I'm also finding at the moment that um, I don't really get to use my iPad as much as I had hoped for because I find that I have to sit down with that, whereas the phone is on me all the times. And um, I can kind of take five minutes here and there and use the phone to do something. Um, and then everything, in, as part of my job, like I make all the content for whatever that we do. So 
and it, there's just me. So it has to be quick and uh, it has to be different every time. For the it art centre, that is. Yeah. So um, and like if I just had that to do in my day just to concentrate on this, I, I could give more time to it, but I need ways to do it quickly. So I, I found that I've been using um, Adobe Spark Post and Adobe Spark Video quite a lot lately, um, just because they're easy to, um, like it kind of holds on to the work that you've done already and then you can kind of remix it really quickly. And um, Emer, mm. have you subscribed to the Creative Cloud? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because uh, if, if you do on your iPad, uh, and yeah. on your phone, um, I encourage you to mm -hmm. use the Lightroom app as as a camera. Uh, it will pull it oh. in. It will it will be very high quality, and you can do insane adjustments. Oh, also, I've got Lightroom will, on my phone. And it will yeah. sync to the cloud when you're on your computer. You'll have all of these things uh, both on your iPad and your phone. Um, the Creative Cloud, uh, I find, is a very very useful um yeah tool. absolutely yeah. yeah 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 and i find even just with work using like whatever about <clears throat> i use all of them i use audition i use after effects for things i use premiere for things sometimes i but but it always needs to be things i can use quickly and also things that can be available to me on all the devices so uh yeah creative there cloud is go. brilliant yeah. um and spark the the spark stuff is like that as well um it's just really quick and it sort of puts the text in for you. You can add music really quickly. Um, I know not directly related to um, photography as such, but for anybody out there who's trying to uh, negotiate a job like mine where you're required to be the social media manager as well as having 10 other hats, um, it's these things are really, really important and take up an awful lot of my day. So uh, other things that we've been doing are trying to find ways to um, like talk to people while our building is closed and stuff. So all that uh, becomes important. And we've um, you'll see in my pick of the day, I've sort of uh, chosen this new piece of technology that we're buying in at the moment. And it's um, ice staging with a little 360 camera so that we can do virtual tours in the gallery. Mm. So that that's going to be a whole nother workflow to learn. So um, but isn't it cool to learn new things? It really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You never stop, do you? It's no. Like one thing. No. Yeah. But that's that's good. Yeah. Cool. So <laughs> like minting NFTs. Yeah. Oh, there's a hint. Oh, there's a hint to a future whoa. episode. I haven't even watched that video yet. Whoa. <laughs> Um, let's let's not go into uh, NFTs just yet. Um, no, no, no. We have several more weeks. Well, we uh, th this this that. this might this this wave this big boosty wave of of NFTs might be over in a few weeks. Let's see for that. <laughs> well, let's yeah, find if out. It, if it, yeah, we will. I'm very long <laughs> on co I, I'm very long on on crypto. So um, no worries about mm -hmm. that. But anyway, let's let's not. Uh, Let's climb not down that, that ladder right no now. So, um, no sidetrack. No. So yeah, completely different from Jeremiah's workflow. Like I think we're all so different. Oh, yeah. The, oh, yeah. the thing, the is, thing is, uh, yeah. Emer, we only talked about one image of mine because I, I have I have that kind of workflow myself too for different kinds of more abstract pieces. That speed is, of is can be I make a, a piece episode. of art in five <laughs> minutes? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, that that's why when, when we talked about like workflow, it's like, well, it just depends what I'm trying to achieve. Right. That will totally determine uh, workflow. Did we lose Emar? Possibly. Well, she, she'll be back. Um, Adrian, what is going on on your side of the pond? Well, what's going on my side? So, so I, I guess I should stress that this is my early 2021 workflow because it, it does change quite frequently um i i like to explore new ways of doing things so i'm, I'm not somebody that stays particularly consistent I'm but back. i do uh i do tend to i do tend to stick with one workflow at a time if you like you know, rather rather than have have many so so right right now um most of the the capture i'm doing is with my phone 
um yeah regular listeners will re- remember i got a new phone late last year um and uh that gave me a whole bunch of capability that i was keen to explore and play with so that's the, that's the capture side i have uh, a number of apps for that depending on what i'm doing if i want to do uh computational depth of field shots usually it's the i usually use the focus app uh, for that for the camera and and editing the depth of field uh i often use halide as well uh for shooting uh, the new Apple Pro Raw, uh, mostly, uh, and uh, yeah, it just it, that all gets dumped into the camera roll uh, on my phone, uh, and that is that is the way where I keep my, all my images. So even if I'm using a, a, a dedicated camera, I'll get the SD card out of that. I'll put it in a little lightning dongle, and I'll I'll ingest all of that usually into my iPad, occasionally into my phone. But the the Apple Photos environment is is what i use to keep all my photos in mm. i've got discs full of old lightroom libraries and before that aperture libraries never liked lightroom i was always in the, in the whole in the days of the old aperture versus lightroom i was always an aperture user never never mm. a lightroom user and i only ever took on lightroom. one of those how'd that, how'd that work out for you one of <laughs> yeah those. well <laughs> Well, do you know what? Um, it didn't work out very well because <laughs> Apple stopped supporting it, didn't they? Exactly. So, yeah, so uh, at that point, um, I took on Lightroom, you know, because it was the, the only robust thing out there at the time. Um, uh, and then, uh, but I, I, I've never been a fan. The only thing I did like about Lightroom, actually, was the, the way you could make um, selective adjustments using gradient tools, either linear gradients or, or radial gradients. That, but now you it. can do it with many different application yeah it's still difficult to find though because i am still ios mostly um or ios first in my photo workflow uh, luminar so, luminar you use that right? uh it, i don't have luminar actually but i don't think they have an ios version do they but uh, mm, i don't know um i'm just uh actually i'm I, i'm like as we record this i'm a couple of days away i think from ordering one of these fancy new laptops where the ipad apps <laughs> work on the laptop as well and stuff like that so so uh, I think having not had a new laptop for about seven years and all of our, all the podcasts I do are now moving on to YouTube, of course. So <laughs> it's just like there's more stuff well, to do, more things to learn. So, or or so adding it or adding it. Or adding it, yes. Sorry. No, yes, I just want to make point. sure everyone understands this is going to be a podcast. <laughs> It's for your audio pleasure. It is, yeah, it's a Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So then we get to, to so then there'll be an, any number of, of apps uh, to, to edit all of that stuff. And then the, the, the back end of my workflow these days, I'm tending to print quite a lot, uh, uh, six by four, uh, six by four inches uh, on my little uh, Canon selfie dye sublimation printer. Uh, and then those get tacked up onto the wall uh, and they live on the wall and, people you know in the middle of the house and people walk past and they say i like that one i don't like that one uh and i let them stay there and i look at them and and i think okay yeah which ones do i still like a week later or two weeks later mm. and stuff like that and so the the the, the just the stuck up on the wall tons of prints thing is part of my workflow at the moment so um, can i ask you something i like that so sure. people people walk by mm. uh, your wall of pictures and go i don't like that picture <laughs> we actually do <laughs> well so let's qualify that because it's kind of true actually i was i, I mean yeah it, it's not quite like that but uh i mean clearly clearly the only people in my house at the moment are my family so that <laughs> my wife and uh-huh. my two delightful uh-huh. children and uh that and, is... and they are brutally honest honest <laughs> they they are. Like, children are so, well, especially seeing as that you know, often you know, the only people I've got to take photos of at the moment are the family. So, so mm-hmm. you know, sometimes I go, oh, I don't like that picture of me, or I like that one, yeah, you know, like that one of him, or, mm-hmm. or whatever, you know. So, so that does actually happen. That is now part of the editing process. But that's because the wall mm-hmm. I happen to use is at the bottom of the stairs. So, <laughs> so everybody walks past it all the time, which is great. Mm-hmm. Yeah, happy with that. Uh, and uh, then the ones that stand the test of time uh, uh, are a little bit more looked after. Um, uh, so the, the the next step, in fact, actually, um, I, I've got a backlog of stuff because I'm not very good at completing this workflow. But the next step is to uh, is to look at those prints more closely and to do a, a better edit and to order a professional print from somewhere. I have a. A good idea for us in cool. terms of workflow that we would uh, edit each other's pictures. Okay. That could be sure. fun. Sure. That's that interesting. 
that's a good idea yeah yeah it is a, it could, yeah it could be so so last thing on my workflow i guess i would say is is stuff related to video um mostly in the last few months the only video i've been shooting is for school assignments uh, for from mm. online schooling so uh, half the time over the last three four months or so we've had a green screen hanging up um so that the kids could do green screen uh stuff and we can we can play with video on luma fusion teach the kids to edit using luma fusion and teach them about keyframe animations and stuff like that you know so they can move themselves around on the video screen um i love that we've done one or two um one or two floating head videos <laughs> um uh, so so we have in the house uh, uh, it was a gift at some point for one of the children i don't even know which one um a harry potter invisible cloak uh Very good. Uh, which is um, green set mm. which is basically yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's dark on the Excellent. outside and it's green on the inside so you turn it mm. round and you put it round your neck and you completely and and and, and stand in front of a green screen awesome. and you chroma That's all of that brilliant. out and you get that whole floating yep. head look which is quite good fun <laughs> So, what are so you, you what are you using uh, for? Do you use Luma Fusion for video only, or do you use their still photography uh, version? They do have that. Ah, oh, no, I haven't used the still photography version yet. What's remind me? Forget you what, what it's called, but uh, it, the, yeah, it's they quite have, good. It's quite yeah. good. I can't Maybe remember. I don't, that's she, no, I may be getting confused. I know Filmic Pro have a stills camera now, don't they? But I don't know that I knew that LumaFusion did have a different app. <coughs> I think they do. Is yeah. Filmic, Filmic Pro's is called something like First Light or something like that, isn't it? And so, I've been meaning to test that out, but I haven't got around to it yet. Um, or, good hmm. question. Okay, I'll figure it out. Well, we'll figure so, it out Chris, and put it in the description. Yeah. What is your workflow, Chris? <laughs> Which one? I mean, this is the, the, when when you started <laughs> posting those nine photos. That was um, that was a trigger for me to go. Well, do I really have like different workflows or different things? Yes, of course <laughs> I do. And I have one that is very formalized, very strict, and that is when I do workshops and photo tours and travel, which I now at this point pretty much have forgotten how to do. So, uh, <laughs> but, but, but for that, because it's always under pressure, I have no backlog. I have this really down to a T with organizing things, rating them, uh, mm. working on them, filing them. And then when I'm done with the tour, I'm back home and everything is done. And this is the only way for me to do it because otherwise I'll have a backlog pretty soon and it grows and grows mm. and doesn't go away. So that is like the when, formal workflow. But when you're on tour, um, do you do uh, backups every day yes. when you return? <clears throat> yes. Uh, do you so. do them into your computer, or do you use a a device? Uh, you know, a hardware yeah. device. Yeah. So so just you, just uh, just pretty pretty short. Um, I, I ret we return to the hotel with the group. Um, first thing I do is I put my batteries on the charger. I start an import of my photos into um, Lightroom, um, which which I have, where I have my, my photos on an external SSD. So Lightroom is on the computer, the backup of the catalog and everything is on external SSD, the photos as well. Uh, I go take a shower when I'm done, Lightroom is done importing and has all the previews rendered and everything. And then in, um, and then I have the photos on the external SSD. I have the, the previews rendered on the laptop and I have a copy of the photos on the memory card. So that's my two places. I have the photos in the memory card and the SSD. German efficiency. Home, when you get home, do you back them to the cloud? Yes, of course. <clears throat> so when, when I'm home, I, I import this entire catalog uh, onto my main computer. That's the one I'm sitting in front of right now with a big catalog. And yeah, it's, it's, it's roughly 100,000 photos on that one as well. And those get all backed up to a NAS in the basement um, and the cloud. So... And a time machine, so it's like three backups everywhere. And I will not format the cards unless these things have backed up twice. So, 
But this is really the, the very formal workflow. But then I have other things like tiny things around the house. Um, for example, some product photography that might be just uh, Monica has just written a blog entry about baking a specific kind of bread. So I did some food photography for uh, for a blog and that doesn't really have a specific workflow. I will import things in Lightroom. I will tag them and edit them and choose the three photos that are the best and that's done then. Do you? Do you use Photoshop at all? Nope. It's um, ninety nine percent in Lightroom. Uh, if I yeah. need to, uh, if I need to do a very complicated, specific job, let's say cloning something out, and I need something good to do that, which Lightroom doesn't really do well all the time, then that goes into Affinity Photo because the in painting <laughs> algorithm in Affinity Photo is second to none. It's really good. It's very good. I have it too. I don't use it as much as I. Yeah. And I, I stopped I using Photoshop um, in favor of Affinity Photo. I'm still paying for it because I'm still I still pay for the photographer's uh, bundle of uh, Creative Cloud, which includes Photoshop and Lightroom. Um, mm. But other than that, I have moved over to the Serif products: Affinity Photo, Affinity Designer, and Affinity Publisher. Those three. Yeah, they're no, they're excellent, and they're the future in in many ways. I mean, the thing about Photoshop that is very exciting to me. <laughs> Uh, comparing it is the amount of secondary plugins that work seamlessly. Oh yeah, with it. it's it's a huge ecosystem, and there's a yeah. lot of good things in it. But I don't need any of that. So yeah, for me, uh, I, I, don't, I, I, I use Affinity Photo. So I I use Affinity Photo on my iPad um, because I like to to. I mean, I like to have that level of control sometimes. Not 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 every time, but sometimes mm. I do. And, uh, and and I've had that since before there was a version of Photoshop for the iPad, you know, so, you know, it was, it was, it was, it was there as a fully featured app a long time before Photoshop came out as a fully featured app. Mm. So, you know, it, I, I'm, but I, I, I like it. I mean, it, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm using probably less than 5% of its capability, but. <laughs> With all these tools, you find what you need and, and, mm. and. And the more you really kind of drill down on the tools that you use and need, the better it is. And then when you need to add a tool, uh, even you just go to YouTube, there's somebody who's going to explain oh, that yes. over and over again. That's how and everyone learns these days, yes. Yeah. That's right. And you yeah, go I like, did. you know, Definitely. Yeah. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. So, so, so this is actually one of the things I use it for and, and more, more sophisticated tools is when I want to make a more sophisticated selection. And I should have said this last week on our what does editing look like in 10 years from now. Mm -hmm. But, but I, I would just wish that, that selection of stuff in photos was easier, right? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, the, the, no matter how hard I try over the years, I still can't really grasp what the 10 different selection brushes do and how to refine selections and things like that. Just It's one of the reasons I really like, um, uh, I like, you know, uh, you get this in Snapseed, but also in Lightroom as well. The Like I said, the uh, the radial gradients for selective ch adjustment and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And the uh, the other, um, well, I suppose, because it's, it's Snapseed, isn't it? It's, it's the same technology, but the, the Nick software, you know, uh, technology where you, where you, t you, you pick a point and then you can drag a radius from it to make adjustments. Yeah, that, I use that. Yeah. Really it's, um, that I, I just wish there was some, some fully featured Nick software versions for iPads. I think that yeah, would be great. Cause be I really do love to work with yeah. the pencil rather than I, I'm, I'm hopeless with the mouse. I, I think that's coming and the next generation of iPads will have enough processing power to do that. I mean, you know, well, it does Photoshop. in Snapseed, doesn't it? <laughs> it's the same technology, it's the same code. <laughs> yeah. Photoshop, Photoshop right. I mean, on the iPad. I mean, we, we've see, we've seen how good these selections are with the with that uh, tool that you suggested once, Adrian. Remember the one where the, the trees and the skies didn't really separate well. <laughs> oh, that <laughs> was you know. yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 that was a new app that somebody had launched, wasn't it? Great yes, selections, but. and I have this on my, you know, on my workflow. Is uh, I've been uh, just for the last uh, six, eight months, really drilling into uh, Topaz uh, mm -hmm. and their AI and their selection, their masking tools, their mm -hmm. Gigapixel blow up. They have put so much effort into um, making these tools better and better and better every few months. And um, I, I find their, their masking tools are nothing short of uh, dramatic. 
uh, much better than any other software that I've seen in terms of speed. Okay. Humor. Uh, because mm -hmm. you, you basically draw crudely what you want to keep, you draw what you want to get rid of, and where they flow together, you paint another color. They're okay. called trimasks. And that color, which uh, they default to blue, is where the computing power focuses its attention. Ah. And and that's interesting because then mm. you get to play with the adjustment mm. just within that narrow band of flow. That's so. interesting. So so I mentioned earlier because yeah, I mentioned earlier that I was, I'm just about to to order a, a laptop. I think um, one of the one of the new M1 laptops. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to trying out were two things really. One is to is to to actually get uh, have a machine that's new enough that it can run DaVinci Resolve uh, uh, at a decent pace because I love the color adjustments in in DaVinci. I love the way the concept of the way the nodes work. I love the way that you can qualify what you're you know yeah. it's essentially masking by another term, but they call it the qualifier uh, and uh, how you pick what what colors and tones that you're going to work with with any particular edits. I love color wheels rather than sliders. Yeah, that's all of that sort of stuff. Photoshop and I'm going to try that. that in sorry, sorry, Jeremiah. Photoshop does that. Oh, Lightroom does uh, that now. Color well, uh, my, yeah, pick, does, my yeah. pick of the week does it a little bit as well. But yes, okay. um, so but I'm looking forward to that. And I'm going to I'm also looking forward to trying it in sidecar mode. So so yeah. for those listening uh, or watching that are not Mac users, um, yeah, if you buy a new Mac, uh, or, or actually it's been like this for a few years now, um, you, and you have an iPad, uh, you can use your iPad as a second screen and you can have, therefore, your, you can run Mac apps on a touch screen. And I'm looking forward to, to trying that out to see if there's, there's any new workflow things uh, that I can do there. So... Mm -hmm. So definitely um, some future, there you go, future of, what does this mean for the future of, of my photography workflow? <laughs> um, it means I've got to go out and buy some new toys and try and play those, maybe. <laughs> so um, looking at the clock, we're almost 40 minutes into this episode and uh, Jeremiah still has eight workflows left. I still have two, <laughs> I still have two workflows left. Um, should we make this into a two-part episode? How about that? <laughs> Well, it's interesting. I think for people also to understand all the different tools that I are available so. to do different things. I think right? so. So, uh, so if we're all okay with this, should we should we uh, move on to the picks of the week and then continue this next week? How about that? Absolutely. Yeah, works for me. I'm yeah. not right. going to have any new workflows by next week. Though. I'm going to invent <laughs> one just so I can keep up with Jeremiah. I promise not to add. We'll any just more. pick holes in years. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Fine. That'll be fine. <laughs> Like I so, said, I, I live in Hollywood, pe being <laughs> picked on. With that, uh, and, let's and, and, um, let's go to the picks of the week. I'll show mine first, and it is an article about uh, someone. Okay, I have to switch over. Here we go. Uh, about <laughs> someone doing. Let me fix the size of this. Yeah, uh, shooting. Um, well, it, it's about it's about compositing photos out of a combination of photos of people and one by six scale props so those photos are um really deep and interesting composited. and uh, wow. but they are composited from like tiny sets and real people and this this uh, article goes into how to do that and how to prepare the people in front of the camera there's video showing that and then um the whole compositing and how this goes together here's a prop of a chair which is again one sixth of the scale and uh how this all comes together and with the lighting and with the um, setup and it's it's a good exercise in workflow it is a very specific workflow to this uh, art form and there's videos about the different kinds of parts of this here's one about uh, how how to build the props so the artist shows how they how they built the props and then yeah, the next uh, is how they shoot the people and how they then later composite this together. So it's a really... Also nice. seems very cheery. Uh, <laughs> it's got the, a bit of a the on the, the coffin on the <laughs> screen, let's just disregard that one. <laughs> making the room so that they're building the room and then putting the people oh, electric in. Electric chair. So. Mm, yeah, yeah no uh, guillotine. It's a very, Absolutely. very light-hearted right, kind yeah. of... Uh, yeah, it seems cheerful. Thing. Good but for hey, all, the whole family. But hey, it's, it's, a, it's a really good 
uh, learning <laughs> experience yeah. oh. regarding uh, compositing. I really like that. Yeah, so. I love it. Yeah. Never mind the con the content. Um, <laughs> Adrian, you chose an app. I did. I did. So uh, I. Uh, this this is an app that I, I love for the way it handles color adjustments. Um, it is called Pixelmator Photo, not to be pro confused with the half dozen other apps that Pixelmator make for different platforms. This is the one that is uh, it's it's a uh, well, I guess you could say it's a Lightroom type uh, app, and it is iPad only. Um, it has uh, it uses the um, uses the asset management that comes from the iOS photos album. So you, you, you can work with your photos and your camera roll and things like that. But it has some great color adjustment stuff in it. Um, and I, I really like it for that. Um, so it, it is really focused on color adjustment above anything else, I think I'd say. It's, it, there's a, the marketing for it speaks a lot about machine learning. I don't know quite what data sets they're training it on. Um, it, I, I, my experience of it is it's when you press the auto fix button, it's possibly slightly better than some other stuff I've used, but, but, uh, you know, I think there's a lot, a lot of people that talk about machine learning and I, and AI and, uh, well, it's and a bit of a this. buzzword sometimes. It is, it is. Um, at least they don't email. say that we, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so it's, it's, uh, it's a great app and I love it. And, um, I wish there were, uh, I wish it was available on the phone as well, actually, but they don't. It's not available on the phone. The Pixelmator for phones is different from the one from it's the iPad. It's really so. hard to get the usability right on very small screens. So it is. It is. How much is it, Adrian? Uh, I have no idea. I've Seven dollars ninety-nine. It, it says okay. here. Oh, yeah, I was going to say it's not an expensive one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's uh, and it, huh? for me, it's um, it, it it's a go-to if I'm if I'm if I've got a a larger number of photos and because it's got batch mm. processing in it as well you can uh, uh and it has one of my favorite things which is a crop uh the, it has different setups for crops um and particularly it has well, funnily enough they call it the 47 to 20 crop <laughs> but oh. for those more for those more more used to thinking in terms of ratios that end in a one it's a 2.35 to one um, which is a favourite crop of mine. Uh, well, two through five—that's anamorphic. Uh, exactly. Yes. Yes. But the, for some reason, in this app, they call it forty-seven to twenty. Weird. <laughs> I guess they. Well, I guess they've upped it to integers, haven't they? So there you go. By the way, never tried. Anybody... Never try to outsmart a director when it comes to aspect ratios. <laughs> <laughs> Has anybody noticed this movement on uh, Apple Marketplace uh, in terms of apps that? are sliding you into these absurd subscription prices? Has that flowed over to Europe yet? Uh, now you go and you buy, you get an app. It no longer tells you the price. It says... It doesn't tell you the in-app purchase prices, yes. No, and some of these okay. are like, oh, yeah, this is great. You have three days and it's $7 a week. Yeah, I, really? I've actually wow. come across like, a couple of those. Uh, it's yeah. just really, really problematic, mm. I, I find. Um, yeah, I've got no problem in paying for, for software. That's, yeah, if that's, you're using it constantly, well, yeah, like, but yeah, it's $350 yeah. a year for something yeah. you use. Uh, and often, you know, often they're a bit one-trick pony-ish mm. as well, aren't they, mm. some of these yeah. things? Yeah, it's, it's – uh, anyway – Anyway, beef. back to the peaks, up to the picks. This is Jeremiah's picture instruments. Uh, oh, yeah, this is part of a part of a workflow process uh, in, in terms of adjusting color, which comes out of uh, some of the things that Adrian uh, likes. But uh, you know, we could talk about uh, lookup tables and LUTs forever, but. Let's say one found a photo that uh, was, you know, just had a beautiful combination of color. Mm -hmm. You could take that into this particular software and generate uh, a lookup table, a LUT, which you can then bring into Photoshop and apply to um, your own photos. So it's, it's, it's a way of generating lookup tables for still and and, and, it, uh, and it steals them from film. existing photos pretty much yeah yeah cool. it, does. it does i, I it have just... i have this actually i <laughs> i like this one <laughs> cool. i do too i, I um it, it's it's absolutely a beautiful tool 
for very specific things. Um, you know, there's a lot of different ways of getting color, but in terms of quick, you go like, oh God, I love that overall combination. Just create your own LUT and, uh, and then make adjustments to that so you can then tailor that LUT. Yeah, I think I first got this just not long after Blade Runner 2049 came out. <laughs> So yeah, I was thinking, and, and of course you, why. you get yeah exactly yeah. So you get all of these wonderful, all the wonder, wonderful, wonderful cinematography in that movie, yeah. um, and uh, you know I, I had great fun trying to you know uh, harvest some of the color looks from there. I, I really don't know how they do it. I mean, they do a, a, a pretty good job, I think, if I remember I right. So I haven't too, used it for yeah. a little while. I, I don't know how they do it without reference to reference well, images. What so they're doing is really a. a, a kind of a color masking or luminance masking, right? They're reading the the colors specifically and where those colors are. You know, it's just a sky, purple, you know, the main road and the combinations. So it's kind of rough. It gives you a, a blending combination of those colors. Um, and and it, most of the time it works very, very well. Um, you know, I mean, it's not something that, that is your immediate go-to. But if you want something, if you want to take a reference of from Blade Runner, for example, um, it's it's just a really good. Uh, is that is that something tool. that would be used in like a proper Hollywood production, or is that sure? Just, just, oh yeah, they they would use tools like these. Well, uh, yes. Uh, the answer is, I mean, I, I directed and produced a miniseries uh, about ten years ago. We were one of the first ones to use uh, digital. Uh, capture mm, okay. um, and uh, we did you know obviously you know I kind of did a 4k master uh, on screen in terms of color but what we found is before we started shooting uh, because it was uh, kind of you know kind of new what we did is we created about uh, 25 or 30 LUTs, and we use different kind of combinations. This particular thing was not available, but we, we basically created our LUTs, the DP and I, and when we would get to an interior, say, late afternoon interior, we would just plug the LUT right into our processor, and when we, we would capture it in RAW, but when it, when it outputted to the lab, that LUT... Uh, addressed the kind of, you know, it was heavily cyan based in terms of the shadows and it, it adjusted the way we wanted it. So it made the color um, adjustment when we were going to broadcast very quick in 4K. Okay. So we had our basics. It's not a finely tuned instrument. It's a rough instrument, but it gets you much closer and then you can do the fine secondary color corrections after. But uh, the quick answer is yes, there's there's a lot of different kinds of ways to produce that, uh, that LUT or save a LUT from something that you would already create in terms of your mastering. All right. Thank you. Uh, last but not least, Imar with a hardware recommendation. Yeah. <laughs> what is I know, the yeah, rotator? This is probably not useful to anybody else except me at the moment. Uh, this is a little, um, you can attach your, your iPhone onto this and it will turn it into a 360 camera. And it's the lens that you attach onto your phone. Oh, it spins um, it around. Yeah, yeah. So um, we, as the Art Center uh, in my job, have just um, purchased a subscription to this and are waiting with bated breath <laughs> for this to arrive. And it's taken ages, actually. <laughs> but um, yeah, so we hope to use it in the gallery to make virtual tours mm. well going forward pretty much um just in case so uh clearly we're not open at the moment so our program for 2021 hasn't even really launched yet so the the january exhibition is going to happen in april and it will be um kind of uh, shared with the public in this way so that uh, sounds good that sounds great so yeah. you, people be able to see stuff uh, you know, a lot more easily yeah i was actually at a um at a an exhibition launch today, um, virtually, which is very interesting. Interesting. <laughs> My first time really um, seeing that being done, but it was great because actually the gallery director was uh, walking around the gallery uh, showing the work in a webinar scenario. And then the artists were online and 
he was interacting with them and they were speaking about the work uh, to the audience, which was lovely because, I mean, often at a kind of an in-person opening, you don't really, you don't often get that much um, interaction with artists, especially. Um, they're off doing their thing and uh, everybody just, you know, mulls around and, and has their own look at it, but... You don't, drinks crappy you, wine. Yeah, you don't really... <laughs> we never serve crappy wine, excuse me. Um, <laughs> only the best. Um, but, uh, yeah, look, who knows when we'll ever get to have one of those little soirees again. But um, until then, this we hope this is going to be our, our saving grace. Do you think galleries will go the way of, of movie theatres? Um, well, I know, just going from our own point of view, we understand now that... Anything that we plan from now on has to be uh, deliverable online uh, forever, yep. you know, because um, if it's not available in like actually at the moment, we're still only hoping for in-person interaction, maybe in the summer. I don't know. Um, it's it's been a very, much. very tough and, and fast learning process for everyone. Really yeah. fast. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But um, but everyone seems to be taking it on the chin as well. On the other hand, and um, I think as long as everybody's just a little bit kind to each other and not, you know, don't get hung up on the too hung up on the techniques of the thing, and that like these things aren't perfect. The first one probably won't be perfect, but you know what? We'll improve every time we do it. So. Of course. Um. Yeah. It's the best thing. Just just so, get yeah. started, like with a, with making a podcast yeah. or something. Get yeah, started, yeah. and it'll. It'll figure, figure things itself out. out. Mm, mm. All right. Thank you so much. Um, so, yeah, that was it for this episode of The Future of Photography. Um, we are delighted that you're with us. We are also very delighted that at least a few of you have already clicked on subscribe <laughs> on our YouTube channel. And again, if you can do so, um, please do so. It'll help us out to be more visible and it'll help the YouTube algorithm to figure out what's important and what isn't and of course we i think fall in the important category for sure so um you can find us on the web at thefuturephotography.com on twitter at tfop now on insta at tfop now and um yeah and happy saint patrick's bye. day on happy saint patrick's day <laughs> everyone take care until next bye. time bye bye <laughs>